Good morning. Christ is risen. Uh, we are going to start off the service with a prelude from uh, Miss Linda Code. She is going to play uh, the risen Christ. Thank you, Linda. Good morning. Will you stand with me for the greeting? Although it isn't, uh, the sunshine isn't shining here, it's shining somewhere, and it can shine in our hearts because, alleluia, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. On this very day, God has acted. Today, we will rejoice and be glad. We know the message that God sends to all people. God's peace preached by Jesus Christ is available to all through the Lord of life. The one who lived among us, doing and healing all, was crucified, died, and buried. But God raised him on the third day. This very day, God acted. Today we will rejoice in the glad. Let's pray. God, just as you raised Jesus from the dead, you offer us new and transformed lives in the risen Christ. We rejoice and give thanks for the good news which has been handed down to us from generation to generation. May we too be witnesses of Jesus, you who anointed with the Holy Spirit to bring blessings of mercy and healing. May we be witnesses of Jesus' suffering and death and how he meets us in the broken places of our lives. Most of all, may we be witnesses of the resurrection, sharing your promises, promise of forgiveness and grace with all people. This is your doing, O God. It is marvelous in our eyes. Amen. We'll now greet each other for the passing of the peace. Good morning to everybody who's watching at home. Hello.
of cheer and just the time I need him he's always near he lives he lives Christ Jesus lives today he walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way he lives he lives salvation to impart you Thank you. You may be seated. Good job, guys. And it was so nice to hear all of you belting it out. It's like, yes. It just makes my day when you do that. Well, if I haven't met you before, my name is Terry, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at North Vernon First United Methodist Church, and I want to welcome you. Thank you for being here today, whether you're here in person or whether you're joining us online today. We are grateful for your presence as we celebrate this foundational day in the Christian faith. A few quick announcements. I want to thank the guys who who had breakfast ready for us this morning, for all of you who brought a side dish. As usual, I ate too much, but thank you for doing that. And please take your leftovers home after church because I don't need them. This this is the first time in several years when I can actually button this coat. (laughs) So also want to thank everybody who, who donated flowers. I know that some of you, like me, your nose is probably running right now because of the pollen, but it's okay because they're beautiful. There are tags on these things that have your name on them, so there's no need to fight over which one's prettier after church today. So so take ones that have your name on it, please, after church, so that Lois and I don't have to water them all week while you forget to get them. Um, But thank you for buying those flowers and decorating decorating the sanctuary and reminding us about new life at this period of resurrection. I also wanted to thank everybody who donated candy, who stuffed eggs, and who helped with the Easter egg egg hunt yesterday. Um, The kids had a good time, the adults so-so, but but they all walked away with bags of candy, and and I kept stealing some from my granddaughter yesterday, but she finally caught me and I had to quit. But, (laughs) But thank you to everybody who helped with that. You guys have made this this Holy Week really special. This is the first Holy Week in a while where I really felt that connection and, and um, felt like we did a fairly good job of getting us to today. So thank you for all that you've done for that. I'm not going to go into the another announcements about meetings. You can read it. If you're on a committee, pay attention. We'd like your presence here. Um, and with that, oh, the kids left. If you are a child or a kid or a kid at heart, You might want to go get those kids. I have gifts for you. 
And, but in order to get your gift when you come up here, you have to say Happy Easter. So anybody want to give it a shot? You guys are not too old for candy. Come on. <laughs> no? You don't want candy? Oh, my God. Okay, I'll bring it. Yes, finally, a brave soul, somebody who's young at heart. I'm going to give you two so you can give them to your grandkids. Thank you. You're welcome. Garrett, you're still young. Catch. Whoa, good hands. <laughs> no, you guys, no. Yeah, no, I got to get these guys first. Yeah, I'm going back. Oh, David wants one. <laughs> Anyone else? Get them while they're hot. I got to save two for my grandkids. Oh, here comes one. Did you know what? Oh, you guys made it just in time. Oh, you, get, you guys get the full bag and the little bag. There you go. Make sure Nico gets one, okay? Gone, yes. All right. Now I got to figure out where I'm at in this whole process. <laughs> Praises and prayer requests, that's what we're doing. Um, all, all of you know that, or should know by now, that Doc passed away this past week, um, and his services will be at Sawyer Pickett this Wednesday. The Masonic, the Masonic rites will happen at 12.30, visitation from 1 to 3, then the funeral will take place at 3 o'clock, and then there'll be a funeral dinner here that Steve's working on, so if you can donate food, um, please let Steve know. We still don't quite have a number. Um, but Doc will be interred later in his hometown, so we'll be going straight from the funeral home to here. We're figuring the dinner's probably going to be between 4.30 and 5. Um, so if you could help out with that, that'd be great. Um, please keep in your thoughts and your prayers. Um, all the folks that are homebound that are on our list this week who couldn't be here with us, but I'm sure would love to be here. Um, some of them watch us online, which is, hi, guys, and <laughs> good to see you. Um, but just keep them in your thoughts and prayers because it can be a lonely time at the holidays with no one um, coming around. Um, I also, um, I had a, a long conversation, well not long, sort of long, with um, Amy Thompson and again today with Terry. And Tracy is out of town, get, the brother and Amy's husband, or he's out of town getting treatment for esophageal cancer. And so they're, they're like really, really busy right now. So please keep them in your prayers as they're traveling back and forth and as he gets treatment. Um, I also ran into a few people this week who were, who were battling cancer that you may or may not know about because they didn't make a, a big announcement about it. But those folks need our prayer as well. And there's a lot of people already in our congregation who are, are battling cancers. And so please keep them in your thoughts and prayers. And I was handed a note this morning from um, Bev. Um, Bev Martin's mother, Mary, is in her final days of her life. Um, so please pray for comfort and peace and a peaceful passing and also for the family. She's 97 years old, so she's lived a good life. And we, we want to hope that her passing is peaceful and that, and that um, everything goes the way it is meant to go. So with that, are there any praises or prayer requests that you would like to share? And let me be careful here. Um, because we pass this mic around, it goes out on live stream. And more times than not, we're violating HIPAA laws. <laughs> so if you can just do first name, a general category, that would be great. Not a lot of details unless you have the express permission of that person to share those details. Okay, with that. <laughs> yeah, I just want to say how much I appreciated Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday service. And the Good Friday service was especially meaningful. Thank you, Joe. I want to thank everybody for the cards, prayers, and everything in passing to my father. Thank you. Hey, uh, Terry talked about the, the meal. Uh, I do have my sign-up sheet with me today, so, and some people uh, volunteered this morning. Anybody else, uh, please, you know, see me there to the information booth after the service and uh, you know if you haven't done it before it's fun uh, a lot of people benefit and there's a lot of fellowship at those meals so 
Thank you. Our friends, Nancy and Gary, uh, they're waiting to move him from the hospital into hospice. But Nancy is, is better, and I thank you for your prayers. Thank you, Susan. Anyone else? Yes, ma'am. Thanks to Lois for helping me arrange the flowers yesterday and for organizing the egg hunt. And Betty had a lot to do with it, and Kathy. Uh, there's a lot of behind the scenes work for all of those activities. And a lot of people spend a lot of time to try to make that a success. And I, I want to say that I'm glad that we had the opportunity to um, remember our loved ones. Uh, I miss mine dearly, but I'm grateful to God that I had them for a while. And also grateful for Easter. And we're grateful for you, because you guys may not know, but she's the one that takes care of all the decorations in the sanctuary. Every time the colors change, she's the one here doing it. She gets the stuff dry clean. She takes really good care of our vestments. Anyone else? All right, seeing none, let's spend a few moments praying. Um, we're going to begin with our silent prayer while Linda plays quietly while we pray. It's an opportunity for you to pray about anything in your life that you would like to lift up to the Lord. It's an opportunity to... Um, lift up anything that you've heard today or, or anything you're feeling, and then I'll offer a pastoral prayer, and then we'll close with the Lord's Prayer together. If you're not familiar with that, it'll be on this one screen behind me. Dennis is working hard to get the other one going. The one screen behind me, it's also in your bulletin, so let's pray. Almighty God, we've taken uh, just a moment out of our time together today to be a community of faith, to be people who love and care about one another, who places where we feel comfortable sharing the things that make our lives difficult and knowing that the people around us and that are watching online are here to support us, Lord, to pray with us, to, to empathize with us, and to be there for us. But Lord, first and foremost, we want to express our gratitude for your unconditional love. The love that you have for us that follows us everywhere we go, that no matter what we've done, who we are, or where we've been, your love never ends. It's long-suffering, and it's forever. And Lord, sometimes in the midst of the difficulties of our world and of our lives, it's, it's hard to keep that in our minds. So help us to, to always know that you're there. Lord, we kind of hope for sunshine today as we celebrated Easter, but what a unique Easter to have sleet on the ground when we get here today. Thank you for that amazing gift, unexpected gift. Lord, we thank you for the Easter egg hunt and the, and the kids that we were able to minister to. We're grateful for the breakfast this morning that we were able to sit and fellowship and eat, and we're grateful for the people who brought food and the people who made food and served food. Father, we're grateful for all the people throughout the year, but especially Holy Week, that it takes to do worship, to do church, to provide the opportunities to live our lives of faith. But Father, as always, there, our hearts are weighed down, even on this day of celebrating resurrection because of the things that are going on in our lives or in the lives of our loved ones, Lord. We know that there are many people within this congregation and within the reach of this congregation, Lord, that are 
battling cancers or illnesses and some are winning the fight, Lord, and some are holding steady and some are losing the fight. So, Lord, we pray that you'd be with those people and their families as they care for them and as they begin to, to grieve and mourn what might be coming. Father, we pray for Mary, who's 97 years old, Lord, and is at the end of her life and is, and is ready. So, Lord, we just pray that you'd give her permission to let go so that she might be able to be with you. And we pray that you'd be with Bev and Tom and the family as they sit with her and as they, as they watch with her, Lord, for her departure to be with you. Father, we pray for Doc's family. Doc was a conundrum and we all loved him. Never quite sure how to take Doc sometimes. But he was an amazing man. He cared for a lot of these people here as animals. A lot of people in this community as animals. So we pray with you that you would be with Kelly and his son as they lay him to rest this Wednesday, that you'd be with his friends and family in his Sunday school as they mourn the loss of another person, Lord. And we just pray that as we move through this week that we might remember, Doc, finally, that we might use this dinner Wednesday afternoon to help people turn the tide on their grief and to start thinking of, God, of Doc in terms of the good memories and the times that they had with him in their lives. So, Father, we pray for everyone on our list. It's, they're here for a reason, because they're hurting or because they're ill or because they just need, need to know that you're there and that we're there. We pray for our, our homebound on this particular Easter day who can't be with us, and we pray for all of those in our community who, who struggle emotionally or physically or spiritually. We pray for those who are battling addictions, Lord, those who are battling illnesses. We pray for those who don't have enough food to get through the end of the week, that don't make enough money to get to the end of the month, and who don't have places to lay their heads and call home. Father, we pray for those around the world who only have access to drinking water that is poisoning their families. We pray for those around the world that are in war-torn parts of the world, who are running for their lives. Some can't run. They, there's nowhere they can go, and they're dying by the thousands, Lord. So we pray that at least on this Easter day that peace would break out so that people can have just one day without worrying. And Father, we pray that as people that you've called together to hear your voice, that we would be active in the world, that we would be active in making change, and that even in this moment today as we've gathered to worship in person and online, Lord, that we would be people called together to hear your voice and to feel your presence among us in this moment and in every moment. And all these things we pray in Christ's name, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, thank you. Please take a deep breath and then please stand and join us in singing the doxology. The doxology is a hymn of thanksgiving. Thank you. Um, one quick announcement on the altar communion table. I brought in um, the, the chalice and the plate that I bought when I was in Israel, and it's the five loaves and the two fishes on both. It's in a mosaic, and you're welcome to come up and look at them when you get your flowers, but don't take them. <laughs> They're mine. 
and it's a long drive back to Israel to buy more. Anyway, our text today comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, beginning in verse 1. When the Sabbath was o- let's try that again. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He's been raised, and he is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go tell his disciples, and in particularly Peter, that he is going ahead of you to Galilee, where you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for, with, for terror and amazement had seized them, and, when they, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The word of God for the people of God. Please have a seat. I made a mistake and closed my Bible, sorry. Anyway, I think it's interesting that all four gospel accounts of the resurrection, the first people to find the empty tomb or to see Jesus are women. Typically, we've been trained to believe that women in the ancient world didn't have any agency. They were thought of as property. You know, they didn't have any power. They weren't allowed to give testimony in court. They weren't to be believed. But recent scholarship has found out that there was a lot of women in the ancient world that actually were people of means. These three women in particular supported Jesus as well as other women probably throughout his ministry. Some of them that supported the early church were actually small business owners. They had businesses dyeing cloth or or providing other things. And these women had independent means of wealth. And a lot of them were the ones that supported the early missionary journeys of Paul. They were the ones that supported the churches who opened up their homes to the house churches. In fact, without women, Christianity probably would not have flourished the way it did. So we're finding out that, yes, while a lot of women were poor, dependent on the men in their lives, didn't have any agency, didn't have the right to vote, to make decisions for themselves, there were quite a few women that were well-to-do, that were wealthy, and they used that to support the ministries of Jesus and the ministries of Christianity in the early church. And I think it's interesting, part of it was cultural, But it was the women who said, we have to go prepare Jesus' body. Men weren't thinking about it, right? They were off hiding somewhere, making plans for the future. But I want you just for a minute, if you can, and you can close your eyes if you want to, but if you start snoring, I'm coming to your pew and waking you up, to put put yourselves in these three women's shoes for a moment. I honestly believe the more I read the Bible that Mary Magdalene was probably actually in love with Jesus. His mother, of course, loved him. Salome, who is probably a relative, loved him. They loved him because, one, it was just a person to love, but also because they'd seen the love and compassion that Jesus had had for other people and for them. So how could they not love him? You know, they they followed Jesus around for three to three and a half years. And they supported him. They cared for him. But they were more than just housekeepers or cooks. They were also disciples. They were followers of Jesus. They were supporters of his ministry. And in that three and a half years, they had seen him with love and compassion heal people who had been blind or lame from birth or people who had struggled with illnesses for years. They saw him out of compassion feed 5,000 men and women and children at least once. 
They'd seen him raise children. Can you imagine being a parent in the ancient world where the mortality rate is really high and your children dies and this healer, this guy who proclaims to be Messiah, raises your kid from the dead, the compassion, the love, and they witness this? They saw Jesus' emotions on display. They saw righteous indignation when he cleared the temple, which was what got him finally killed. They saw him emotional when he weeped at Lazarus' death. Jesus showed compassion and love to everybody he encountered. They heard him speak with authority. They saw him breaking down barriers that Judaism had put in the way of a relationship with God. They saw him go up against the imperial world of Rome and say, you know what? They don't rule you. God does. How could you not love this man, right? But they probably were also at Gethsemane when they came to arrest Jesus. They saw Peter hack off the ear of Malchus and saw Jesus heal his ear and reattach it. Told Peter, put your sword away. Violence isn't the answer here. They probably didn't witness his trials because they wouldn't have been allowed that close, but they probably saw the after effects of his trials and his beatings. They saw him hanging on the cross and he died. And for three and a half years, they'd put all their eggs in the basket of Jesus. He's the one. He's the Messiah. He's loving. He's compassionate. We love him back. He's done so much for us and so much for our faith tradition. He's freed us from all the bonds that the world has put on us to be free to worship God in new and different ways. But now he's gone. Three and a half years of dreams and hopes and love, gone. Have you ever had a time in your life when it just felt like your world was coming to an end? It might have been financial, it might have been an illness, it might have been the loss or potential loss of someone that you loved a lot. And it just feels like the world stops. That's how these women must have felt. I'm really not crying. It's the, it's the flowers behind me making my eyes water. Sorry. Uh, I'm going to have to move farther out next year. But, but they've, they've invested three and a half years into their life, and now it's all over. And they probably knew that, you know, Jesus traditionally died on Passover, right? The, the, the beginning of Sabbath. And so they knew they had to get his body down. So they go to Joseph of Arimathea, who's a member of the Sanhedrin. And he's probably the only reason why they got Jesus's body back before dark, because Rome didn't give bodies back. When they crucified bodies, they left them on the cross to rot and decay for the vultures to pick out until they were bones to send a warning to anyone else that was going to go up against Rome. So the fact that, that the Roman authorities actually listened to Joseph and let him have the body is a miracle all in of itself. But they're so pushing sundown on the Sabbath on Friday that they can barely get him into the tomb and have the stone rolled across there so they can get back to wherever they're going before the Sabbath begins at sunset. They didn't get to prepare the body the way traditionally they would have done. Can you imagine how restless that night of Sabbath must have been. I don't imagine any of them got much sleep. And the next morning, it's Sabbath, because Sabbath is from Friday at sunset to sunset Saturday, right? You're not allowed to do any work. You can't do anything. They're thinking about Jesus lying in that tomb, and he's unprepared for death. They're thinking about what happens to us next. Are the Roman authorities looking for us? Are the Jewish authorities looking for us? What's going to happen to our lives? And the next night, I'm sure they didn't sleep much, but then they get up at the crack of dawn as soon as it's daylight. And Mark says the first day of the week, right? Sunday for us. And it says they, they bought the spices they needed to embalm Jesus' body, and they began the journey to the tomb where he was laid. 
Now, this in and of itself is a, is a perilous journey for them, right? I think there were a couple reasons why they got up at the crack of daylight. Is once they could avoid other people because they were probably still worried that the Jewish authorities and Roman authorities were looking for them so they could fully stamp out this Jesus movement. But they also knew when they got there that the guards at the tomb may not let them in. And there's this giant heavy stone and they're too weak to hold out of the way. Why do we? They're up against all these things. And they get there. And sure enough, the stone's gone. Now this is probably, oh, thank goodness, because <laughs> I don't know how we were going to move this stone. But then when they walk in, Jesus' body isn't there, and they run into this guy, this young man in white clothes. And that's the Bible's way of telling us that this is a messenger from God or an angel. And they're like, in the ancient world, you didn't want to run into angels. It was never good news usually, right? And he goes, hey, <gasps> He goes, you came looking for Jesus of Nazareth, didn't you? Yeah, he's not here. Look, where you laid him is empty. But what I want you to do now is I want you to go to tell the disciples and to tell Peter in particular. And I think Mark picks out Peter specifically because Peter was probably one of the most grieved of the disciples. Because he's the one who told Jesus, I will stand with you till death. I will go to the cross with you. I will not let this happen. And he denies Jesus. And I've got to believe that the guilt he was. And so Mark makes a point of calling out Peter as a way of telling Peter, hey, it's okay. And instead of going and telling Peter and the disciples, it says that they were seized with terror and amazement and they ran and they hid the words terror and amazed in the greek are interesting terror is pretty obvious it means to tremble it means to physically be ill and to shake they were so afraid of what just happened not just they ran into an angel not just that jesus's body was missing not just that their lives were in danger now but whatever all those together and they're trembling They've come to embalm his body. And I'm sure that that they just dropped what they had and ran, right? But as opposed to this trembling, this almost being ill to your stomach and, and shaking so bad, is this word amazement. And in Greek, it means to have an out of mind experience, to experience something abnormal, to have this sense of ecstasy, right? So they're scared to death. And they're amazed beyond belief and they're happy beyond belief because there's this inkling in their mind that what Jesus said was going to happen has happened. Have you ever felt both of those emotions at the same time? I was trying to think about the first time I rode a roller coaster, or maybe you guys, I started thinking, what, what, you guys are so old, it's like, what would they have ridden when they were little? <laughs> So roller coaster is my best one, right? You remember the first time you're watching the thing do all the, and you're scared to death to get on it, but you're so excited to go, right? That's what they felt. When I was in my early 20s, I took an advanced rock climbing class at the college I was at, and we went to Seneca, West Virginia, and to pass the class, I had to climb a 450-foot rock face without dying, Right? and put all my skills to work that I've been learning for 10 weeks. And I remember as my climbing partner and I were hiking up to the beginning of this climb, I was so scared, I was sick to my stomach, and I was trembling. But I was also excited and amazed, because now I get to see if I can really do this. And it was kind of funny, because I got about to 300 feet up on the pitch, and you put rock, things in the rock, and you clip your rope, and so if you fall, hopefully it catches you, and you don't crater. But if my foot slipped, and my adrenaline pumped, and my hands were like drill bits. I was not falling. But I, I had this sense of terror and amazement. It was almost an ecstatic experience. And this is what these women were feeling when they went into hiding. Can you imagine that? Okay, you can open your eyes and wake up now. You know, it's really hard for us to put ourselves in that time, in that culture. And unless we try, we never really get the import of what the Bible is telling us about the stories 
that the gospel writers and Paul and the other writers are trying to share with us. Every time you read a passage of scripture, you should be going, how can I get in their head? What were they thinking? What were they feeling? How did it affect them? And you'll have a much deeper sense of the stories that are being told. And I think in Mark's version of this story, there's at least, at least three things that we can take away from this. The first is perseverance, right? We all go through times in our lives when things are hard, when things get in our way, where it gets hard to be faithful to what we believe and what we say we believe and what we think we should do. And these women, they had all kinds of things going against them, right? But they persevered to go do what they knew they needed to do because they loved Jesus, because Jesus had loved them and shown them compassion. They put their lives on the line, just coming out of hiding to go to the tomb. They, they, even though they knew they were going to have trouble with the stone, they persevered and still went to the tomb, right? They were women in an age where women were not very well respected or thought of. And yet all four Gospels tell us that women were the first ones. These women persevered through all of that to do what they needed to do. And that's a lesson for us, right? I mean, we're all going through things at different times. In life. There's a lot of you in here that I just learned this week are going through a lot. But because of the love of Jesus and the love of God, we are able to persevere, to set those things in perspective and continue to do what God has called us to do and to be the people we've been called to be. Because if you let these things get in your way, that's on you. If you don't persevere, if you don't change the conversation, if you don't change the script, that's on you. Because if you persevere, there's a better ending on the other side of that perseverance. And in their case, it was the risen Jesus. The second thing that we need to understand is this story is not about resurrection because we're never told Jesus rose from the dead. Mark just tells us the tomb was empty. It's not about the women and the love and perseverance they had for Jesus. It wasn't about the grave. It wasn't about the crucifixion. In Mark's mind, this story and every facet of it, and his readers would have thought this, was a story about God and God's work in that moment. It was God who rolled away the stone. It was God who sent the women. It was God who sent the messenger. And it was God who raised Jesus from the dead. Mark's story of resurrection is not about any of the other things. It's about how God acted in the world in that moment to do something new and different that is foundational to the Christian faith. And the third thing I want you to take away from today's Easter service is this. If all of you had opened your Bibles, you might, depending on which version you had, you might have noticed that when I stopped, it continued going, right? There's additional verses. Interestingly enough, those are an alternate ending that were added to Mark much later. The first, the first copy or first manuscript of Mark that we have comes from about 150. And we always believe that the earliest manuscripts are probably the most accurate manuscripts because they were the closest to the events, they're closest to the oral traditions because over time, oral traditions gravitate and change and mutate. So in almost all of the first and earliest manuscripts, this last part isn't there, which means Mark ended this story of resurrection abruptly. His body's gone, the women ran. That's it. And later editors had to add all the other stuff that the other Gospels had to make it make sense, right? So there was a, another ending that was added hundreds of years later. And so the scholars have been going, well, why did Mark end it so abruptly? And here's what we think. 
because Mark expected his audience to write the ending for how it affected their life. How does Mark endings affect your life? What do you believe about the resurrection? Where in the story of God do you find your story? Because see, just like Mark's readers, we can take this as an opportunity to go, wow, what does this really mean for me? How does this affect my life and my faith and the way I live them out in the world and in community and in the four walls of this, well, yeah, five walls of this, six walls of this church? I'm not a mathematician. How do you deal with this story? That's the question Mark is asking his audience, and that's the question I'm asking us. From this story, where do we go? In the United Methodist Church, our communion table is all who would like to participate. You're not required to. If you don't want to come up, you don't have to. If you're unable to come up but would like to participate, please um, let someone tell us and we'll bring communion to you. Christ invites to his table all who love him, who seek the forgiveness of sins, and to live in peace with their neighbors. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church. You delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and by the Spirit. By your great mercy, we have been born anew into a living hope through the resurrection of your Son from the dead. And to the inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Once we were no people, but now we are your people, declaring your wonderful deeds in Christ, who called us out of the darkness into this marvelous light. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised the gift, promised to be with us always in the power of your word and your Holy Spirit. And on that night when Jesus was with his disciples for that last time, and after the supper was over, he took a piece of bread from the table, and after giving thanks to the Father, he broke the bread. And he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take, eat, all of you. This is my body that's been broken for you. And each and every time you eat this bread or any piece of bread at any meal, remember me. And in like manner, after the supper, Jesus took a cup from the table. And after giving thanks to the Father, he said, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. It's the been blood that's been shed for your sins and for the sins of many. And each and every time you drink from this cup or any cup at any meal, remember me. So, Father, we pray that you would pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to the whole world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord's table is set, and I invite you to come.
Easter people of Jesus Christ, this very day God has acted. Jesus is raised from the dead. Let us rejoice and be glad. Amen. 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 